So we hear the scripture, and is it any wonder where the television drama writers get their ideas? And how much juicier do you want it than this particular story in Genesis? In a previous chapter, it's recorded that because Sarah is unable to bear children, she presents her lovely Egyptian maid Hagar to her husband Abraham so that he might father a child with her, thus establishing an heir for his ever-increasing fortune. And Hagar gives birth to his son Ishmael. But when Sarah, even in her advanced age, is then blessed with their child Isaac, Sarah's attitude towards Hagar and Ishmael turns sour. And one day, Sarah catches Ishmael laughing at her son Isaac, and she boils over. Now this is where the message interpretation of the Bible translates a word very literally, yet accurately. Ancient Hebrew writers are well known for their wonderful use of wordplay. The word laughing is also the same word on which the name Isaac is based. Ishmael's laughter infuriates Sarah and she demands that Abraham throw out that other woman and her brat. <laughs> Ishmael's doing what most any rich kid, boy, might do. He's teasing his baby brother. Well, Sarah swoops in, scoops up little Isaac, and carries her toddler away from this obnoxious tween. And she's fuming, there's no way that that kid is going to be in charge of my son. You've seen that show, right? The visiting relative wears out. They're welcome in somebody else's home. And the woman of the house stamps her foot down and tells her husband, they got to go. Okay, well, this is a little bit different. Okay, it's much different and much more complicated. Sarah's gone from zero to witch in two seconds. You know, from offering her own maid to be a surrogate mother to demanding Abraham throw Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert. It's akin to a death sentence at worst, or very likely a life of possible enslavement for Hagar and her child. I don't know how he does it, but somehow the next morning, Abraham takes this water bag and whatever food he decides they need, gives it to Hagar and tells her to go. Tries to say goodbye to Ishmael, but of course Ishmael refuses his father's farewell, and can you blame him? Anyone ever spent any time in the desert? I mean, you have to experience the heat to understand the thirst. It doesn't take long for them to run out of water. And days go by, and the two become weaker and weaker? And what mother could endure watching their child literally collapse from thirst? I mean, she can't bear it. A, a parent helpless to help their child. And in her own thirst confusion, she staggers away. She says, I, I cannot watch my son die. And why would God let this happen? What kind of God makes a woman watch her child die? 
And in her grief, Hagar is unable to see that just a little bit farther away is the water well that will indeed save their lives. It wasn't until her eyes were opened to the possibilities that God had in store for her and Ishmael that she realized life wasn't over. God promised Hagar the same thing that was promised Abraham. A great nation would come through Ishmael's bloodline. A bit too simplistically, it is this story Christians tend to point toward as the reason Jews and Arabs don't get along. There's more questions than answers here. I mean, how could Sarah make such a demand in the first place? How could Abraham, the man of the house, cave in to Sarah's demand? Here's what really gets me. Why didn't this rich guy come up with a better solution? He had plenty of money or resources of some sort. I mean, how could they become so inhospitable? It was just a few chapters ago in Genesis where their hospitality towards strangers was rewarded with the news that indeed Sarah would conceive, they'd have a child, the child they had prayed for so long. Why is it that we treat the ones in the most obvious need so poorly. Genesis chapters 12 through 21 are rich in the theme of hospitality. So what do you think of when you hear the word hospitality? Do you think of the cookies and fruit that we have out here in the welcome area every Sunday? That's a nice touch. Do you think of the genuine friendliness of the greetings that we share, not just with one another, but with our visitors? That's an even more important aspect of hospitality. Do you think of where you park your car as hospitality? I mean, that says more than any words of welcome that you can think of. Those of us that are able should be parking as far away from the door as possible so that our visitors can see that we've been expecting them. If you've been coming here more than a year, you're not a visitor anymore. <laughs> so you don't get to park in a visitor spot anymore. <laughs> and do we make our building look like we've been expecting company? I mean, who invites guests to their home and doesn't make it presentable before they arrive? I mean, of course we do our best. I mean, yeah, we might shove all kinds of stuff into the spare closet <laughs> or down in the basement, but we make the effort, right? I mean, after all, we want to make a good impression. I mean, it's obvious for vacation Bible school, our volunteers just did a terrific job of making this place look very welcoming, very fun, how colorful it is, all the great decorations. We have wonderful teachers and, and helpers. And I just can't thank any of you enough for, for what you did this week. It was just so much fun. And uh, you, could, you could hear it in the roar in the building <laughs> with all the noise from the kids. But hospitality is not just waiting for people to come to us. It is us reaching out to those, even of a different faith, to share our love. I mean, that is the purpose of our trip, to welcome refugees to America. To let them see that no matter what they hear, 
There are good people in this country that do not hate them. Our little trip is not going to end terrorism. It's not going to bring peace to the Middle East. We're not going to correct the wrong that Abraham did to Hagar and Ishmael. But for seven families, it is going to be reassurance of the love that exists in humanity. For all the haters that say, we can't take care of our own, this message is for you. Abraham had plenty of money to take care of Sarah and Isaac and Hagar and Ishmael. America has plenty of resources to take care of those who need affordable health care and food and a safe country in which to live. Our church shares in ways that churches many times our size do not. I can't speak for them. But I'm grateful for you. Can we see the possibilities that Abraham could not? Amen.